Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Joe Russell, and I'm the Policy and Advocacy Director for OACB. We wanted to start out from a high-level view, just get your brains warmed up. Um, the world is changing very rapidly, and with so many ways to communicate today, there are, there are so many more voices to listen to, and of course, there are so many more opinions to consider. It's for this reason that advocacy has never been more important, or as I like to call it, it's super important. It's so important, in fact, that it's one of the OACB four pillars of our mission. So to get the most out of our advocacy efforts, we need more help. We can't do it alone. And so we've created this advocacy chair program with the hope that we can get more input and more activity within each county that will support the overall team effort. And we'll show you how that's going to happen. Now, I do want to make a brief note that when I talk about advocacy, what I'm talking about is legislative advocacy. There are different types of advocacy that we, we're not going to go into all those different types, but for purposes of today's webinar, we're talking about how we are engaging in advocating to lawmakers and the executive branch of government. So whether you're a seasoned veteran or whether you're brand new, thanks for joining us on this journey to make and improve, make the DD world a better place and improve the world for the county boards. So to get our advocacy juices flowing, so to speak, I wanted to start out with a little bit of a story. Uh, it comes from the last budget, and it involves, uh, it tells the story of how powerful the advocacy program can be. In the last budget, Governor Kasich proposed to eliminate $70 million of what's called tangible personal property tax. And for some of you that were involved in that effort on the webinar, I'm sure you're cringing as we speak. But obviously, this wasn't cool. So, so we geared up and fought for and worked relentlessly for uh, those particular dollars, which made it more difficult given all of the new money that was in the budget. We created talking points. We issued countless calls to action, which related or translated into thousands of calls, emails, direct meetings, and ultimately, we were the only group that was able to get or secure tangible personal property tax relief during the normal legislative process. Now, some of the schools got some money, but that wasn't, that was during the dark hours of the, what do they call that? The, the conference committee, that's what it's called. So just to recap, what we're going to talk about tonight is we're going to talk about the purpose of the program. We're going to talk about how the advocacy chairs help legislative advocacy effort. We're going to talk about how we're going to, how OACB is going to support you as an advocacy chair. We're going to talk about when this all is going to happen. And of course, last but not certainly not least, we're going to talk about the state budget. So being an advocacy chair is a small time commitment, but it makes a huge impact. We're going to do as much groundwork as we can on the back end to support you on the front end in working with, talking with, and ultimately trying to uh, get your legislators to support your county board. The primary purpose is to improve our advocacy efforts locally, as well as influence policy outcomes for the county boards and people with developmental disabilities collectively. You're going to see that as a theme in our overall advocacy effort, that what we do locally matters at, at the state level. We're going to achieve this through expanding board members' engagement in advocacy. We want to increase local involvement in advocacy. And we want to develop stronger local relationships. We're going to go into those in a little bit more detail. So being an advocacy chair is not, I repeat, is not a big time commitment. In fact, it's a small time commitment, but it makes a giant impact. OACP, 
OACB is going to provide you with the information to support your engagement activities. We're going to kind of lead you, so to speak. We're going to uh, give you the information of what some of the big issues we're talking about at the state level. We're going to uh, brainstorm and talk about what the best approaches are from an advocacy perspective. And then we're going to give you the tools that you need to, to make a quality outreach to those legislators. As you'll see through some of this stuff, the time commitment is small. It really involves uh, a lot of discussions, really. It doesn't, and with our new systems in place, it's going to be really easy for you to make the outreach effort. Um, and, of course, we're always here to supplement any, any needs there might be. It's really important that you understand that your participation is not, it's not just helping OACB. It's it's helping your county, and it's certainly helping people with developmental disabilities in your county. So let's hit that big easy button and make a big impact. The, again, the purpose is to improve the local advocacy effort in addition to the statewide efforts collectively. And I put this uh, picture in the slide to kind of represent that perspective is very, very important. Depending on your perspective, you might think that the upper hand is drawing the lower hand. Or depending on a different perspective, you might think the opposite. The thing is, is that sometimes the legislators think that the lower hand is drawing the upper hand when we think the upper hand is drawing the lower hand. So it's important that we share, and it might be for a good reason. So it's really important that we share that particular perspective. Now, as a constituent, your legislators really value your opinion. In fact, I go as far as to say at times that your opinion is gold. So depending on how you look at things will definitely impact the, the way that you approach talking about things. Now, where, where the advocacy program and the legislative advocacy effort collectively come into play is that there is power in numbers. If we can meet with one legislature and tell, legislator and tell them that the upper hand is drawing the lower hand, and we do that all around the state, before you know it, all the legislators have the same opinion, and that's kind of where we want to be. But ultimately, the legislators need to know their local impact, and that's where you come in. So success is achieved through expanding your fellow board members' engagement and advocacy. You could do this in a way that you feel most comfortable with, but the key is, is to get more people talking about and interested and it really excited in the county board mission. Increasing local involvement in advocacy really means to advocate more for the county board mission. So what we're looking for is we're just looking for there to be more involvement at the local level with discussions with legislators. And of course, we want to develop stronger local relationships. We want other people to, to find value in the county board mission. Uh, we, I've talked a lot about in the past what we call an echo chamber, where we start talking to people, and before you know it, that becomes sort of the, uh, the common knowledge, so to speak. But the more local relationships we can develop, the stronger our advocacy efforts going to be. So how can, how can you help as an advocacy chair? Well, there are three primary things we want to talk about today. The first is to generate advocacy dialogue with other board members. We'd like you to partner with your superintendent to facilitate the advocacy outreach. And we want to expand the county board outreach into the community and recruit supporters where and when appropriate and possible. Let's dive into these individually in a little bit more detail. So to generate advocacy dialogue with board members, what, I, what we recommend you do is to, to take the policy brief that OACB sends out and choose a topic from the policy brief that's relevant to your community. Talk about that issue and then seek input from uh, and opinions from other board members. And it's just like when you're talking around the table with friends, soon enough people start coming up with ideas on how to 
solve that problem or ways that you can expand your footprint, so to speak. The other piece to, that's important to generate dialogue with board members is to allocate a specific time to discuss legislative advocacy. Later on in the webinar, we talk about um, potentially allocating time uh, during like board members or whether you, or board meetings, I'm sorry, or whether you want to do that via email. It doesn't quite matter as long as there is a specific time that's allocated for that effort and that people know about know that when that time is. So the second thing is we want you to partner with the superintendent to facilitate outreach. Now, the advocacy chairs are not expected to be the policy experts. You guys are our volunteer board members that, of course, know issues locally, but globally on the state level may not have the level of uh, breadth of experience that are needed to make some of these complicated asks. So you're not expected to be the expert. That's kind of where the superintendent comes in. Um, all the superintendents and the advocacy chairs will receive the same advocacy opportunities. And what we mean by that is you're going to receive policy briefs. You'll receive emails that are sent specifically to the group as a listserv. And of course, you will all receive at the same time uh, calls to action and other, other advocacy campaign opportunities. What that does is allows you to connect with the superintendent and say, hey, how do we want to handle this particular issue? So develop a working relationship and best practices that fits your county and your situation. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if the superintendent's a lead or the advocacy chair is a lead. Whatever you guys are comfortable with, depending on your level of experience, and whatever is going to fit your community best, that's what we would like you to do. Of course, expanding, as we mentioned, expanding the county board outreach into the community is really, really important. And the main point about this is to grow your uh, support base you're going to grow your local influence. The more people you have talking about you, the more influence you're going to have over other actors within the community. Of course, like with any promotional efforts, really important that you talk about these advocacy opportunities and to actually solicit people getting involved. Now, again, this is totally up to you and what you want to do locally. If you don't see that there is a ton of value in recruiting supporters, that's totally up to you. But the point is, and why I put this, uh, probably one of the most successful uh, advocacy campaigns was the Uncle Sam poster from World War II to ask people to enlist. Um, you, can't, you can't get people involved or even interested if you're not asking and you're not reminding them why it's important. So again, I hit that message, that the echo chamber amongst other local influence groups. And what that really means is you're delivering the same message to the chamber group. We want you to create an echo chamber amongst other local influence groups where you're delivering the same message to each and every organization. So you've got Rotary, you've got Lions, you've got all these local groups that you might be part of. If you're delivering the same message before, before long, it's those groups will talk to each other and then those groups will also meet with legislators and then be, it becomes a unified message. So let's talk about how we're going to help you, because that's obviously what's going to make this thing work, is what support OACB is providing you. So there's three primary things. Again, we're going to go into more detail about each of these, but the first thing is to keep advocacy chairs informed. Can't know what to do or, or what to talk about if you're not in the loop. We're going to provide guidance, recommendations, and direct support, and we're going to deliver some special programming and training for you as advocacy chairs. We need to keep you in the loop as advocacy chairs. If you don't know what's going on, you certainly aren't going to be able to inform a legislator or other people in the community what's going on. So we're we're going to be sent. We send out on a regular basis, as needed, our OACB policy brief, which contains sort of the biggest issues from a policy perspective that we've been talking about. Has different things with rules. I'm sure you've seen them. If you've not seen them. Please let me know after this webinar, and we'll, we'll make sure that you're on the list. But the key is, and why we threw in this picture here, is that we want you to have quality information and not 
and not just bombard you with information for information's sake. You, are, you will also receive specific communications through the Advocacy Chair listserv. This, if, if it's going to the listserv, it's, it's broad information that will be important for legislative advocacy. It might be best practices. It might be uh, a specific issue or an article that I found that might be important. Um, otherwise, what I'll often do is email you directly. If, if you live in a certain county that's impacted by a new, a new law, I will probably send this to you and say, hey, uh, what do you guys think locally about this issue? And then over time, hopefully we'll develop uh, closer relationships to where I know some of the availability and expertise that are on your board. If I know, for example, that you have a accountant on your board and there's a uh, CPA and there's a new uh, tax issue, that would be definitely a good person to talk with. We're also going to provide guidance, recommendations, and direct support. What, what our goal is is that there's got, not going to be any guesswork, that we're going to give you the who, the what, the where, the when, the why, and the how, so that you're just able to focus on, hey, how do I get this message out there? We're, we provide one-on-one -on -one support. I'm available anytime that you have a question, whether it's regarding a specific policy or, or legislative issue, or whether you just want to set up a meeting with the legislator and you're not really sure how to make that first that first contact. I'm I am here to help. That's what I'm that's what I do. And of course, if there's anything else that that we can that I can do to be helpful uh, for your local advocacy efforts, I'm here to help. Um, I've been traveling around the state, going to different board meetings, and having great discussions about uh, policy and advocacy related issues. And we're going to be delivering special programming and training for advocacy chairs. Uh, this webinar actually is a great example of such a training. Uh, we're going to continue to look for opportunities uh, to provide the opportunities for you to engage, not just with legislators, but with each other. And of course, uh, providing enhanced opportunities to meet and interact with lawmakers will be important too. I think over time, as we get to know each other better, uh, we'll have a better idea with who you who you know and um, how I can be helpful. I already am well aware that many of the advocacy chairs have close personal relationships with some of these legislators, and that is absolutely fantastic. That takes out a big first step, and it allows us to kind of focus more on the bigger goal, which is trying to get their support for county board issues. So as these opportunities come, We'll certainly make you aware of them, and we, uh, of, and also I want to just want to remind you that there's usually opportunities at the OACB conferences uh, that are really great learning opportunities and networking opportunities. So we have a new advocacy software program that we're going to be using for calls to action. If you were part of our advocacy chair team in the last over the last two years you know that some of the calls to action were were lengthy and at times cumbersome to navigate the reason for that is because we had to do it virtually all through email well we took a step back and we looked at how we could do this better and, and what we decided to do was to go with a specific program that was designed explicitly explicitly for what we're doing and so uh, this new program is going to allow us to issue calls to action that are easy for for you to facilitate as well as broader advocacy campaigns. It's really easy to use and all requests can are going to be done through email. So there's there's no need for for us to uh, at, well at times we will communicate hey heads up there's going to be a call to action coming your way but if you're checking your email on a regular basis and, you, and we have your right, correct email then it'll come and it'll be really easy to do. And we're going to go through uh, an example in just a second. But basically, after you read the call to action request, all you have to do is hit the take action button to facilitate the request. And here's an example of how it's going to work. So we're going to do all the background on how to, 
or we do all the background on the talking points, the policy issue, the potential fix. And of course, we have to follow a particular process to vet these, these, uh, our positions with our policy committee and our board of trustees. But after all of that's completed and we're ready to do the call to action, we will uh, put everything into the system and then send out the call to action. So you and your superintendent will receive an email and the subject line will say call to action followed by the main issue. So for example, call to action, uh, tangible personal property tax, needs to be saved, for example. Hopefully it'll be a little bit more uh, <laughs> uh, fun than that. But it will always say call to action, so you, OACB call to action, so you'll always know that, hey, this is a specific request to do something. So the email itself will briefly explain the issue. It'll include the ask, as well as the outreach request. So after, after reading the request and after uh, checking with your superintendent or, or if you feel comfortable enough moving forward, you're gonna, you'll click the take action button at the bottom of the email and then you'll be taken to a form that which, which will verify, verify your identity and your location. Um, it's, it's a form like you would see in some emails um, and what it will do is actually save your information so after your first, the first call to action, uh, it'll keep that information in there so you don't have to keep doing it every time. But it's really important that we have that information, but also that it's connecting you to, connecting you to the correct legislators. And then from there, you simply follow the instructions and complete the action request. Uh, to give you an example, let's just say that our call to action request is for a phone call. We want you to call the legislator to tell them to talk to them about the tangible personal property tax issue, you'll hit the take action button. You'll the form. You'll either fill the form out or it'll be filled out for you. Uh, for you, you'll hit submit, and then it'll come up to a new screen which will have your legislator's information, uh, their phone number. Underneath that, it'll have uh, specific instructions on what you need to do. But the main thing is that it'll have a script, a talking script, as well as some talking points that I'll kind of walk you through uh, the issue. And then from there, once you complete the request, uh, it'll be tallied and provide provide data so that we know um, how many people are, are doing these requests and uh, what kind of quality uh, we're getting out of the requests. I, I promise you that after the first time that we use the call to action, it'll be, it's pretty intuitive and it'll be, it'll be pretty easy to use. So now let's talk about when to act. Um, it's not always very apparent uh, when a legislative advocacy is actually needed. But the action, our calls to action especially, but typically legislative action occurs th throughout the year on an ongoing basis in the following ways. We have specific outreach to legislators. This is when we're going to try to inform them about an issue or influence them on a position. Um, we've got discussions on local problems and concerns. So if you've got a, an issue with your, for example, your auditor wants to have, is, uh, wants you to have a really, really low carryover for your reserve fund, that becomes a problem. That is certainly something that you're going to want to start talking about and potentially putting together a plan of action. And then, of course, in special occasions or as needed. What we're going to try to do is uh, during the lower times, we're going to look for opportunities to, to kind of do some, some programming. Um, and uh, we want you to be engaged throughout the year. And we don't want to just come to you and ask you when we need uh, someone to reach out. We want you to be continually engaged and really stay excited about this opportunity. So, of course, we got the outreach to legislators, and we talked about the calls to action. Those are always going to be issued at pivotal times in the legislative process, and they all they always have time-limited requests. So that means that we might, we might issue a call to action, and you have a week to facilitate it. Uh, we try to give you enough time to, to facilitate it, not say, hey, tomorrow morning by 8 a.m. you have to do this, but because they are connected to a, 
a legislative decision typically, they have to have a time limited request. Um, of course, right now, the big deal is the state budget and in which we're always really, really involved. The state budget occurs the first six months of every odd number of years. It's the biennium budget, so it's a two year budget. And uh, we're gonna talk about that in just a second, but the request, other than the state budget requests will come at slower times. And an example of other requests might be if there is a bill introduced that would impact, um, uh, let's just say, well, impact the, the DD levies, for example. That would be definitely an area where we would want to put together an advocacy effort and we would probably issue some sort of a call to action at some point. And then the last, but certainly not least, is during other advocacy campaigns uh, in which these are not time sensitive. So a good example would be at the end of last year when we issued, we had an advocacy campaign regarding writing letters to the new legislators. So we asked all the counties to write a letter on their letterhead uh, that said, hey, welcome to the legislature. Congratulations on your win. Look forward to working with you. We provided a template to the counties and the counties were able to kind of fill in some of the, um, some detail, but, and put it on their letterhead. It was very, very successful. Those almost never have a, a time limit per se, um, but we do recommend doing it within a specific window. Then discussions on local problems and concerns. Of course, uh, you've got your monthly board meetings that provide an opportunity to discuss major policy issues and to get feedback from your board members on how to address these problems, that provides a natural opportunity, but it may not be the best opportunity depending on um, what's going on. I talked to a superintendent today who unfortunately can't be here with us because they have a board meeting, but they didn't have a board meeting last month, and so they expect their board meeting tonight to be extra long. And um, So that might not be the best time to talk about lengthy policy issues. Um, of course, if you were to use the board meetings as a platform, you'd want to talk with your board president as well as your superintendent before, before going, um, going to that method. But the point is, is you want to find a specific time that you can talk about these issues. And then when talking about uh, with people in the community um, about the county board, you want to get, you want to get feedback on community concerns. You know, if you're at church and you're and someone's asking you about your role on the county board and they say, how are things going? That provides a really natural opportunity for you to say, well, you know, we're concerned over a federal mandate or we're we're happy over the funding that the state's putting into the system. And what that does is a lot also provides an opportunity for people to give you their feedback because that feedback is, is really important as well. Obviously. Uh, your your board are the ones making the decisions um, as well as the superintendent. And you want to make sure that that input uh, reigns over Mrs. Smith at church, although she's, I'm sure, a nice lady. Um, you want to also share uh, the input you've received from anybody with your superintendent and OACB if you feel comfortable or if it's needed. If you can, if you, it's amazing when I start to hear from five and then 10 and then 20 counties that the same issue is happening in each of those counties. It may not be a huge issue, but once, once we find out that that many counties are involved, we certainly want to start taking steps to address it. So here are our next steps. OACB, um, well, we recommend you kind of get started in the following way. So the first thing that's probably important for you to do is to find a time to meet with your superintendent to get a better picture of the legislative advocacy effort in your county up to this point, as well as some of the major problems impacting your county board. Now, if you've been in the, on the board for a long time, probably have a great relationship already, um, or if you've even been an advocacy chair for a while, then you probably know this stuff. So this may not be your first step, but the key is, is to start out by getting on the same page. Um, the second thing is you wanna determine what the best way to engage your fellow, for, fellow board members is going to be. The next thing you wanna do if you haven't already is to review the OACB budget analysis and prepare for our first call to action that will be coming here. Um, very shortly in just a couple weeks. And again, I'm gonna go through that in just a second. But we try to do our best to take, 
what are sometimes really complex policy issues and put them in a fashion that they're easy to read, that anyone could, could sit down and say, okay, I kind of understand what this is going to do. And then we even go a step further to try to, to try to say what the impact is going to be. So it takes less out of, out of the guessing game, so to speak. Of course, watch for our emails, and then anytime you need you need some help, just uh, give me a call, give me a text, give me an email. So, I want to talk now about our budget priorities. Um, we can't go into really deep detail here on this webinar with a lot of these priorities, but I wanted to highlight the big ones that are, are potentially the areas that we're going to ask you to engage. So for this budget, our, our board has set an overarching goal to make the DD system more flexible, sustainable, and predictable for county boards. Uh, I, I often hear the story about when Director Martin came to DODD and his major goal was to make the system more flexible. Well, what he could not have predicted is that there would be sweeping federal mandates that would really fundamentally change the way our system delivers its services. What has happened from that is really kind of an increase at times in regulation and, and has moved away from the goal of, of making things more flexible. So we're going to focus on that and we've set uh, some overarching uh, priorities which our executive director Bridget Gargan is going to testify uh, next two, or next Wednesday on uh, on behalf of OACB. We also have some other folks who are going to be testifying on some of these issues. But our number one priority for this budget it's a, proact a proactive priority, which means that we we were uh, really going out. It wasn't included in the budget. We were going out and trying to fight for it. Is to modernize the waiting list for DD waivers. Now, I don't know that there's any counties that aren't struggling with, with their, their waiting list, and we felt like with all the new waivers coming, with all the changes that was imperative, that the county boards were able to get a better handle on who needs services in their county so we can address those needs. So uh, we've been actively lobbying for that, and we have a panel discussion or panel testimony next Wednesday. And we, we will also be offering an amendment for that issue alongside DODD. By the way, we've been working with DODD on a, a work group for the waiting list, and we've come to what we, what we all believe is a really good resolution. So we're going to be offering that, and this is uh, definitely an area that we're probably going, or we're going to ask folks to get engaged in, and we'll be sending a call to action with everything that you're going to need to facilitate calls, emails, et cetera. The next thing is to keep funding for new waivers. Uh, there's approximately 200 million new dollars, new state dollars, that's creating 700 IO waivers, 300 exit and diversion waivers, and then 300 self waivers. And these waivers obviously are going to allow people, more people to live and work in the community. And it's a continuation of the state's policy to kind of uh, deinstitutionalize, I guess is probably the best way to put it. Um, this, the, the funding, we've got a huge investment in the last budget. So there are some legislators that are concerned that the money, the new money that's in the DODD budget should actually be allocated toward, uh, towards other priorities, um, specifically addressing the opioid epidemic. So we're teaming up with DODD and other uh, DD stakeholders to try to fight to keep this funding uh, for these new waivers with DODD and not allow it to go to other places. So that is another area that will absolutely um, need more engagement on. The third major priority for us is, has been to build provider capacity. Since the federal government has said, hey, county boards, uh, it's a conflict of interest for you to provide services. Um, in addition to getting more people living in the community, it's provided, or it's, it's kind of created a provider capacity concern. And in some counties, uh, 
there just aren't enough people working to to support uh, people with developmental disabilities. And so we're teaming up with uh, Opera to uh, work together to, on solutions to build build private provider capacity in each community. There's a num there's a number of different issues that again I'm not going to go into great length here. Uh, but things such as provider certification as well as provider pay remain amongst the top. Another issue is we want to show that the, what the impact of the opioid epidemic is having on the DD system. It makes sense from a political perspective, but also from a policy perspective. So since we've heard that they want to take some of the new dollars for waivers and put it towards the opioid epidemic, it makes a lot of sense for us to say, hey, we're impacted by that issue too, just don't forget us. And uh, we're also going to be providing testimony next Wednesday on the county board early intervention programs and talk about some of the changes that are happening there uh, and, and really try to show uh, how many babies are entering the DD system because of the opioid epidemic. And unfortunately, it's, it's large and it certainly makes a strong argument for our new waivers. Babies are in the system. So to briefly recap, being an, being an advocacy chair is fairly easy. It's certainly rewarding. There's a low time commitment. And hopefully it'll be fun. You meet new people. It's always fun meeting new people. I want you to remember that you're part of the broader county board advocacy team. You might work mostly with your board and your superintendent, but you're also part of the broader effort. In each county, they have that team. And then, of course, the state level, we have our team. And um, it's becoming more apparent that federal issues are impacting our system. And so... Um, a lot of the uh, members of Congress are becoming more engaged in these issues. Um, so we're part, just keep in mind that we're all part of the same team. Of course, OACB is here to support you in any way possible. I cannot stress that enough. We're going to provide things like this webinar to help you out, but we're all, I'm also available uh, all the time to ask, answer any questions. Um, and to support you in any way, we need to make sure that your county has a strong advocacy effort. And of course, the state budget is here. So let's get started. Let's do it up. So if we have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Well, if we don't have any questions, uh, again, uh, you can email me. It's J. Russell, R-U-S-S-E-L-L, -L, at O-A-C-B-D-D dot -D org.